Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. This is the weekly radio show where we check out the local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry, we catch up with Twanglin Jack over in the Oak Shed and we play local, unsigned and or independent music. My name is Dane Cobain, I will be your host for today and indeed always. Uh, you can reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk And I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with MP3s to share local arts news. Don't hesitate to get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we are repeated on Wickham Sound. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. It all helps. We're going to head over to the Rye Light Zone to catch up with the latest instalment of uh, my Christmas-themed horror story, Black Solstice. I'm keeping my distance. I've got my gun drawn. If he comes any closer, I won't shoot to warn. John Lemon and Yoko Oh No, the Vampire is coming. But Satan Claus did exist, and he was having a bad day. His flying hellhounds had got lost over Marseille, and it had taken Adolf's red nose to sniff out the English Channel. It had been raining in Transylvania, but the rain had turned to snow as they flew west in his sleigh. He drew back his fiery whip, a solstice gift from his friend the Balrog, and swung it through the air. It broke the sound barrier with a sonic boom that echoed out over the English countryside. Now slasher, he cried. Now stabber, now brawler and basher. On killer, on screamer, on pouncer and crasher. And his hellhounds flew on into the darkness. You scumbag, you friar, no match for vampires. The Rogues, featuring Kirsty McBarlow. Just as John Reed was about to doze off for good, he heard a noise from above that sent a chill of fear through his soul. It was the sound of sleigh bells, the horrible funereal gongs that echoed through the sky like a thunderclap. He sat bolt upright in his bed, then shook Mildred into life and put a finger to his lips. Sapnin, she murmured, still drunk on sleep. Are you awake? John asked. What do you think? Yeah, John whispered. I couldn't sleep either. Did you hear something? Like what? I thought I heard something on the reef, John said. I thought it might be, I don't know. The vampire, Mildred asked. She'd woken up a little and had pulled herself up so that she was sitting upright too. John reached over to the bedside lamp and clicked it into life. John, aren't you too old for children's stories? There's no such thing as vampires, husband. There are just people who believe in vampires and sometimes that's just as bad. Ah, those guys, John replied. The ones who get professional fang fittings and who carry out rituals and Those guys are idiots, but just because a few fools like to play fancy dress, it doesn't mean that the real things aren't out there. But vampires, John, Mildred argued. You're talking about bad guys from the depth of the night, created in the twilight hours before God rested. Lilith, the demon wife of Adam and her dark lord husband, drinking the blood of children. You can't believe everything you read in the Bible. I read it on Wikipedia, her husband said. Did you know that you can find a vampire's grave by leading a virgin boy through a graveyard on the back of a black stallion? Sounds fishy to me, considering vampires can't walk on consecrated ground. They used to bury corpses with lemons in their mouths to stop them from coming back. Do you know what I read on Wikipedia? Mildred asked. In 2006, a physics professor wrote a paper proving that it's mathematically impossible for vampires to exist, thanks to geometric progression. If the first vampire had appeared in January 1600 and fed once per month, turning each of its victims into a vampire, the entire world would have been vampires within two and a half years. That's not the point. Then what is the point? I think Satan Claus is here, John replied, and I think he might be coming down the chimney. Come on, Millie, John insisted. We might as well go and take a look just to be sure. Fine. Should I take the gun? No, Mildred replied. If you do, you'll end up shooting someone. Yes, John said absently. That's kind of the point. Last solstice I gave you my neck, but the very next day you went back to heck. This year, to save me from fear, I'm going to hide in heaven. Splat. Satan Claus was coming down the chimney. The front door would have been easier, but that was protected by old magic, a power greater even than he was. He was the Antichrist, the first vampire, and vampires had to be invited over the threshold. He was thirsty, so thirsty, and it was time for his annual feast. Blood was the thing, the delicious nectar of life that sustained him. The blood of virgins was better. The blood of the young was best, for they were free and innocent. They hadn't yet been touched by evil. He worked at night by the light of the moon, chasing it across the sky and returning to his crypt before the first rays of the morning sun filtered over the horizon. The sunlight, along with the warmth that it brought, was deadly. That was why he worked at night. 
Solstice Eve and Solstice Morning until the dawn at least was the one night of year that he worked. Every year his evil elves delivered a list of who'd been naughty and who'd been nice. He'd work through the list, taking care not to touch the paper against his flaming beard in case it caught light. Then he'd shortlist a dozen names from the top of the good list and carry out basic reconnaissance on the run up to Solstice. It was the good little boys and girls who tasted the best. The bad boys and girls tasted like rotten apples and gave him the bloody equivalent of a hangover. And that was how he'd settled on Jesse and Jude Reed. He'd been watching the girls for several months, documenting every decision they made on his diabolical notebook. He tracked their searches on their smart speakers and digitally snooped on them as they ploughed their crops in Farmville or popped bubbles in Candy Crush Saga. He knew more about them than anyone, including their parents. He'd been preparing for this moment for some time, and now he was finally ready. He hit the fire at the bottom of the chimney feet first, but the flames simply fed his desire and regenerated him, leaving him stronger and more determined than ever. He could smell the two girls, and they were ready for him. Satan Claus smiled grimly and climbed out of the fireplace, unfolding himself to his full height in the middle of the Reed's suburban living room. He was bloated, his stomach distended like a starving child in a charity campaign. Lesser vampires resorted to draining the blood from cattle and sheep, but Satan Claus was a purist. Only the freshest human blood could pass his palate, and he was thirsty. He walked out of the living room and out into the hallway, his footsteps falling silently with soft thup thup thups that didn't make an echo. The hallway was dark, but that wasn't a problem for Satan Claus, who could hunt by smell just as easily as by sight. The floorboards creaked as he placed his weight on them, but the sound was swallowed up by the darkness. From above him he could discern the subtle thumping of four heartbeats, two in each of the upstairs bedrooms. He drew his tongue across his lips, sending filthy dead blood dribbling down his chin. He gnashed subconsciously at the air, just like his thralls when they chewed through their shrouds in their graves. The house was an unwelcoming place, packed to the rafters with the symbols of white magic. But Satan Claus was a hunter, and like all hunters, he reveled in the thrill of the chase. It would make his meal all the better. That was the latest instalment of Black Solstice by myself, Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, and this is Twangling Jack Ford with his new track, Music in a Pub with Friends. Sometimes I want to sing about injustice And how we could make this world a better place Sometimes I want to rage against the system And the hardships we all have to face Sometimes I want to wash away the crime That no detergent could ever cleanse Sometimes I just want to go into town and make music in a pub with some friends. Sometimes I want to question why progress must be fueled by green bankers. Make us poor to earn more than they'll ever need. Sometimes I just want to take a break from this cycle that never ends Sometimes I just want to go into town and make music in a pub with some friends Simple 
books And despite the constraints Of meter and rhyme I think I can still make sense And I take my songs As I go into town To make music In a pub with some friends That was Aoife by Hoger's Wolf, and before that we had Music in a Pub with Friends by Twanglin' Jack Ford. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And I'm joined in conversation now by this week's guest, who is a musician and author, Tom Short. All right, well, to go ahead and get started, the first question is my traditional opening question. I asked this of everybody, uh, and it was, it's, what was the last book that you read, and what did you think of it? This is, this is, this is, this is terrible, because I read an awful lot of articles all the time and I don't read very many long books partly because actually my book's quite short because I think I might have a bit of ADHD but not diagnosed but um so but in terms of significant books that I've read recently obviously apart from your book about uh lexicography which of course I've read and lost <laughs> which is a great book is a really long book called Black and British by David Olasoga which is just an amazing look through the whole span of British history right back to the Romans to see how black people and people of colour were were involved and were a part of our society all the time. And I found it, I also found it not, I found it a really a positive book as well. And it was quite hopeful. 
Awesome. Cool. Well, and you mentioned your own book and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but also I want to chat to you about music. So I, I know you as a bass player. Uh, how long have you been playing bass and where did you get your start? Oh, yeah. Right. Well, I was the nerd at school. I still am the nerd. And uh, so I was about 14 and I looked around. I thought I want to be in a band. And I was just learning classical guitar, which, of course, was totally uncool, but a really good bassist. And I thought, basis, sorry. Um, <laughs> and I thought, there's no way I'm going to get to play guitar in any of these bands. But if I get a bass, so I saved up all my pocket money and I spent £42 on a Hona three-quarter size bass. <laughs> and, uh, and I got in a band which was called Brainwave, uh, which was a sort of punk garage band. And so, yeah, and we practiced a bit and did one or two school gigs and that was it but that was that was the beginning and then I played bass in a jazz rock band at uni and I've been basing off and on but I'm really a keyboard player <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's the interesting thing because I was going to ask you as well uh, whether you play any other instruments and if so which ones so you mentioned keyboard uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that and maybe any any other instruments that you can play well I love I love diversity and variety um so one of the things our school did just took us on a trip to moscow and i actually came back with the balalaika and learned how to play that and i still have it and i've still used it in recordings recently um so i'm also part of a band called resonance band which is a global worship band so we have to take our um i meant i'm sort of like the the, the second choice musician for whoever we've got available because we're a bit of a collective last time i ended up playing the congas which i'm actually pretty rubbish at um but every all the other slots were taken awesome uh and i wanted to ask you as well like because you mentioned your worship band and obviously you, you, you know you're a man of faith and i wanted to know like what opportunities has the church and your your uh, faith provided you for making music it's, that's a really interesting question because when i was about I started life when I was about 18. I think I would describe myself as an existentialist. I was into Camus and Sartre and all that sort of posy stuff. And, um, and, but it's almost like there's always got to be something that fills that hole. And for me, it was um, very, very experimental jazz and stuff. And um, so I was really into that. But when I, when I got some faith, uh, that's another story. But anyway, cut on the music. I realized that because music took the God place, it needed to sort of take a different place. And mm -hmm. for a while I didn't do any music, but then it gradually came back and it's more simple. But one thing I have learned is that music is sort of, you know, it, it, it rings through the universe. It's part of creation. When you take a string, even without frets, if you pick it, the harmonics will make a major chord. It's there in nature chords are in nature which is like i mean maybe you never thought that but it's quite mind-blowing uh and so i was I, I i love all sorts of music though um mm. so the music i play in church isn't always the music of my first preference but i guess that's a lesson to be learned as well that sometimes your music is for your own self-fulfillment and sometimes it's for as everybody gathers together and what we often say, this is a bit, this isn't controversial. I'm not the first one to say it. Uh, when it comes to church music these days, it's the least offensive music to the most most number of people, which means it's soft rock. Um, no, I do like soft rock, but it's not what. And also, because a lot of us are amateur musicians, the music hasn't got a lot of chords in it. Yeah. <laughs> You've got G, D, E minor and C. But that doesn't matter because actually it's people gathering together and using their gifts rather than people uh you know doing doing something professionally so i like to move in all those circles yeah well and i suppose as well you know when you get into a band especially i think maybe i think maybe bassists and drummers get the short straw a little bit here because it's quite often you know the guitarist and the vocalist are sort of deciding this is the genre we're going to play and these are the songs we're going to do uh and you know sort of sort of like it or lump it um but you know even like when you think about like jam nights and things like that you don't necessarily you, you don't necessarily end up playing the music you might have chosen yourself 
Um, but I think that's part of the beauty of playing music with other people is that you, you know, you find a compromise, you find some middle ground. Yeah, with absolutely. I just want to add this. We've got this, this guy literally came off the plane from Nigeria in May this year, uh, lives around the corner from the church, found out he's an absolutely kick-ass keyboardist and gospel singer. Does all the Nigerian vibe, but can do like pop mm -hmm. music as well. And I'm thinking, actually, you play keyboards. I'm going to sit in the back and play bass now. I, I might, quite, yeah. might quite like this. Um, but uh, so there you go. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned gospel there because that's what I was kind of thinking as well in, in that, you know, music and religion do sort of go hand in hand in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, a lot of traditional music is is based in religion, uh, like a lot of classical music is religious inspired, whether it, you know, whether it's Western religion, whether it's Eastern religion. Um, and, you know, when I think even when I think of religious music, I don't necessarily think of that like sort of soft rock stuff. I think like, you know, Johnny Cash and Elvis singing gospel, you know. Yeah absolutely um uh well elvis presley's favorite hymn was how great thou art i've mm. just been um the, the the so you know that kind of stuff i want to talk about the roots of gospel rock and roll because mm -hmm. most people think that that started with white people in the 50s but one of my yeah. great heroines and icons is sister rosetta Tharp. Mm. now you might you've probably heard of her yeah. But a lot of people haven't. And I confess, I hadn't heard of her until about a year or two ago, maybe a couple of years ago. But you've got some very old recordings of her pre-war with a gospel choir, but playing that electric guitar like Little Richard. I mean, it's just yeah. just incredible to see how early this stuff was. And obviously, it was then it was commercialized and became the huge monster that rock music is now. But to see her passion and for music and her faith combined I, I find I find it's a really inspiring story yeah for sure cool so talking about stories uh let's change tack a bit let's talk about uh books and you've got a you've got a book out can you tell us yeah. uh, tell us what it is and give us give us a bit of a synopsis right well the book is called Dalek Christianity and of course it's the opposite of Daleks because Daleks want to exterminate everybody who isn't mm -hmm. exactly the same as them so basically uh, the tagline is empathy and understanding in the Bible. So basically, it's a how to book on how do we do diversity? And it can be within the church, but there's an awful lot of stuff that is applicable to a lot of things. Like, do you misunderstand someone just because they're using words differently or because their culture is different and their assumptions are different? Um, and so I explore some of these things. I used to live in Ghana in West Africa, which was an amazing time. And I obviously explore those things from a, a biblical perspective and bring in stories from the Bible. But there's a lot of stuff that is just, um, well, to be honest, sometimes it's just common sense. But um, yeah. also, so each each chapter is like a different kind of lens that you could use to look on life. And I think a lot of times, because we're only used to looking through life through one or less lenses we think that's how everybody else sees life but then if you realize you you're looking at life through different lenses maybe that other person who you think you disagree with actually is looking at life through a slightly different lens i mean i myself have had to learn this i'm not saying i'm a great expert on this in a sense i'm sharing things that i've learned in my journey through life and i've often yeah. found myself to be judging people and then realize actually no i didn't need to judge them yeah yeah, no, that makes sense. And so, like, what did the um, I mean, I guess the I wanted to ask about the writing process and also the publication process. I mean, I guess the writing process begins with you living life. And, you know, when you finally sit down to write it, distilling, you know, distilling some of the yeah. things you've learned along the way into the page. Right. Well, what, what, what happened about two years ago? I kept I just came up with ideas and people said, oh, I, you know, I, I don't like those people because that, that's kind of a bit a bit brash. But, you know. I thought, actually, I've got something to say about this. So what I did is I just started a little Google Doc and started jotting ideas down. And then last Christmas, you know, there's that dead time between Christmas and New Year yeah. when nobody knows what to do with themselves. So I thought, well, let me just look, because I thought it was maybe 30, 40% done and I've got a lot of work to do. I brought it all together and I suddenly realized there were eight coherent chapters and I could actually make a go of this. And I thought, does it need to be any longer? I could tell a different, mm. I could tell another story. I could bring another illustra illustration, but actually it's quite interesting. And one, one uh, friend of mine who's not 
into reading she said yeah 60 pages i could cope with that yeah yeah <laughs> so well, it's other... actually really sure and and the other thing I would say that, you know, one of the questions I hear a lot from, you know, some of the various people that I coach and things, you know, they'll say, like, how long does my book need to be? And the answer is, well, as, as long as it needs to be, you know, the worst thing you can possibly do is try and hit 300 pages because you think that's how long a book should be when actually there's only 100 pages worth of plot or 100 pages worth of material, you know. So so I think, um, you know, you've you've kind of dodged one of the uh, one of the landmines that a lot of first time authors walk <laughs> into there. Yeah, it's actually not my first book. My first book is a ah. is called Breath it's called Breathless in Boriani and it's a fictionalized account of my time in in Ghana but with the country mm -hmm. all rotated east west and you know uh names have been changed to protect the guilty sort of thing and it's all the unconventional and crazy things that 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 happened to me. I don't paint me in a particularly good light. And I think I wrote it in the 90s. And looking at it again, I'm thinking, hmm, uh, I sort of sent it to a few friends, but I never actually published it. So yeah. I don't think it don't think it's ever gonna see the light of the day, but it's very <laughs> Summers, I could ride and I could shoot, and I ventured to the county fair alone. The sergeant in the army tent had shillings on his drum, and his stories and the ale called to me. And before I knew it, I'd received my shilling and a gun, off to fight the French for my king and country. And it wasn't just the foe who saw us coming As we marched in line with rifles in our hands And slaughtered boys who looked like us but spoke another tongue To decide which rich man got to rule the land Centuries on, it's still the same. Everything's different, but nothing's changed. I wasn't good at school, and I couldn't find a job that required all the skills I learned at home. A life of watching movies, playing Xbox, flying drones doesn't fit you. For a standard office clone But I'd seen all the recruitment advertising Let us make you into all that you can be And before I knew it I'd received a bus cut and a gun And the rest is military history To last a lifetime They never said how long that life would be and Those of us who made it back Were not the boys who left our homes To answer to the call of our duty The promise we come back covered in glory We'd be heroes and our country would be proud 
as work for men who've seen too much and can't forget the things they've done and blood spill on that foreign ground. And it wasn't just the foe who saw us coming as we stood there with our papers in our hands. It wasn't in the desert or the field or in the trench But on the home from where we took our final stand It wasn't just the foe who saw us coming As we stood there with our papers in our hands It wasn't in the desert or the field or in the trench But on the home from where we took our final Stand. The final stand. Who rules the land? Who makes the choice? Who makes the profit? Who pays the price? That was Call of Duty by Simon Gregory. And I'm rejoining conversation now by this week's guest, who is mu musician and author Tom Short. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's another that's another classic, you know, professional author kind of thing. I mean, my first probably four books, just they're never going to get properly published. You know, they're 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 beyond rescue. I've I've like looked back at them and I'm I'm like, yeah, I thought that was good at the yeah. time, but looking at it now, yeah. it's like I can't I can't even edit this. I'd have to rewrite the entire thing. You know. Yeah, um, precisely. But. And if is there anything you learned from that process of writing that first book that that influenced this one? Yes, I think sometimes you would use a uh, an analogy or something that is so tied in with the times that within five years it's going to get. I was talking about driving through Ghana and saying, you know, you could get it. You know, this was like a video game, and if you paid five pounds extra, you could get it on a CD. Yeah, well, that analogy doesn't work in 2023. You know, it's yeah. so dated in that way. Um, I, I think some of my attitudes have changed as well. And I've actually learned and mm -hmm. some things that I might have laughed at and seen as a almost negative, I can actually see a more positive now. Uh, yeah, so, so in a sense, because it and because it's autobiographical, even though I'm changing names and things, I'm I'd be less comfortable with it now. I mean, I don't mind if my friends read it, but I don't think I would want to put my name on it. Yeah. Uh, in 2023. Well, and the other thing again, this goes back to what you were saying about the different lenses that people look out at life through. Is in that the lens that we each individually have that changes as well um, over oh, yeah, time and through the yeah. people we meet and 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 all of that. Oh, I wanted to ask you because you because obviously with the title title Dalek uh, Dalek Christianity, I I have to ask you uh, who is the best doctor and why? Oh 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 gosh, um, I mean, I do I do like most of them, but I do I, I must admit, I really got back into it with my kids, so with the the new doctors, but. Um, mm -hmm. I was um, disappointed that Christopher Eccleston only did um, uh, only only did one series. Maybe it's because I'm, although I've lost my northern accent, I'm I'm basically brought, brought up in Bury. Um, there you see. Um, uh, but and on the other hand, I think I think I'm I think David Tennant is probably probably the best all round doctor. And that that craziness of I've got a plan, but I haven't got a plan. Um, yeah. I think he he pulled off better than anyone else, but um, I suppose. I, I, but I'm not. Again, I'm very. Um, I don't really have a strong a strong strong opinion. I know some people yeah. didn't like Peter Peter Capaldi, but I thought he brought back 
a sternness and he looked like he actually looked like some of the old doctors i mean i'm old yeah. enough to remember go, we didn't have a tv at home but i used to go around to a friend's house in like 1964 and hide behind the sofa at this little yeah. black and white picture you know <laughs> yeah awesome cool and so you know who would you say is the target audience the ideal reader for the for the book um you know is um, it because again you mentioned i suppose it does have that those tie-ins to um to christianity but i suppose you can you could argue that it's you know i think there are lessons in it that anyone could benefit from it's, it's absolutely true and also i think i think you might be surprised at what the bible actually says and the diversity that it actually encourages so if you're not a christian just yeah, you're going to get a lot of stuff out of it, but you might be positive. Hopefully, you'll be <laughs> you'll be positively surprised. Uh, yeah. What I really wrote it for was often they have like interchurch uh, discussion groups, and the chapters mm -hmm. are short enough to do in a group. And each chapter has got some questions for discussion, and not only that, it's got some crib sheet answers as well. So if the <laughs> group leader doesn't know what to say. Um, so I did actually try it out in a group way in Johannesburg in South Africa a couple of years ago. And they said, ah, oh, could we have some could we have some model answers? And I thought, actually, that's quite good. That's a clever way of actually yeah. getting more content in without just repeating it. Just mm -hmm. so I've, I've got that a few times. So that's ideal. But I yeah, anybody really. And it is. I hope it's entertaining. I've got, you know, um, it's 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 quite a laugh. It's quite informal. It's very chatty. Uh, it's got lots of stories in and it although it's got like mind-blowing concepts in it's not academic it's yeah, it's yeah. like it's like this idea is going to blow your mind but i'm going to tell you it in a hundred words and then just yeah. let you let your mind explode <laughs> yeah it's like a conversation with a with a friend rather than a, a formal lecture kind of thing oh yeah absolutely absolutely and it also it shouldn't it's the sort of thing where you say, oh, that happened to me. Oh, yeah, OK. Mm. Or it didn't. Or, yeah, I mean, there's one bit that says your story might relate. Your story of faith might relate to somebody who's on a particular journey, but it might not relate to someone else yep. who's on a different journey. Um, so don't be too upset if you talk about your faith journey to someone and they're not interested. It's like, well, yep. maybe that's not where they are. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And do you plan to are you going to be doing any more books in the future? Oh, that's a big question. I've got an idea for another book, and but I don't know if I dare write it. <laughs> I think it's going to be called There Is No Such Thing As Money. Mm -hmm. And um, it starts with little things like, how come uh, certain airlines can charge you £50 at the desk when you've forgotten to book in online? And you know it doesn't cost £50. You know it probably costs yeah. £2. But that's what they do. Uh, you know, how can a successful musician make millions or Taylor Swift into uh, Taylor Swift billions? Mm -hmm. Okay, she works really hard and she's really good, but we know. <laughs> yeah, but you make the music. It takes you X hours to make the music. And then if people like it, you you become you become wealthy, but if they don't like it, it sits on YouTube and <laughs> does nothing. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's a it's a start in. So we're going to talk a lot about that. And but I'm not a great econ economist. I'm a you know, but I I think there's a a need for us to rethink how how wealth works. And I know people are talking yeah. about that. But and then get back to what is true wealth. Talking about relationships, faith, things that money can't buy. Yeah. Will I write it? I don't know. <laughs> awesome. Cool. One to watch. Um, okay. A couple more questions. One I wanted to ask you, I saw this, uh, you'd posted something about this on Facebook. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people about AI recently, and you'd posted oh, something yeah. about AI being used for Bible translation. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about how AI can be used for that. Yeah, it would be interesting. First of all, um, uh, you might have noticed uh, an announcement from Meta a few months ago that said they're going to in expand the uh, number of languages that you can do searches and operate in. And obviously with AI, you need to have a good body of data. And I thought, well, that's all very well, because people say, why don't you use AI in Bible translation? Where, where are you getting the body of data from? And it's like the cart before the horse. It's like all the audio Bibles that are in these minority languages 
that I've been privileged to be involved in uh, sometimes, not all, but a few, <laughs> just a very few. Um, they're actually, that is the data that Meta are using to, mm. um, but how it's used, it, I mean, the main thing that you need in the Bible translation, obviously you need someone to translate it, but then you need a, someone who's a consultant to check it and make sure it's consistent and it fits with Greek and Hebrew and all that. Yeah. And that's usually the log, that's usually the log jam. So, but we are various people, hundreds of people trying all various ways. I mean, some one a colleague of mine took part in Microsoft's hackathon to see how it could be used recently, just a couple of months ago. So it's a bit like Betamax and VHS or <laughs> or Google and all the web and Ask Jeeves. Yeah. We are all trying different ways to say there's I don't think it's going to be a silver bullet, but I think it's going to speed things up in in that you can do the grunt like a bit like in biological research, chemical research, mm -hmm. you can do the grunt work and hopefully, you know. AI will spot inconsistencies and things like that, but don't expect it to substitute your gut feeling and um, also relationship. Real, see, this is philosophically, you know, people say, can AI think? And I actually believe that however intelligent you make it, it's not, in the end, it still has to rely on the, the body of, of data and creative work that humans produce and it's only humans mm -hmm. who are made in the image of god can really be creative because i believe that god is a creator and therefore humans are also creative i mean you know that mm -hmm. we are so creative and we can come up with original things but you look at what ai is doing it's never coming it's very clever but it's never coming up with anything that's completely original yeah yeah Awesome. Cool. Um, okay. So that's pretty much all I need from you. The la last question is two in one, really. So it's what have you got planned next and where can people follow you to find out more? So specifically, I suppose, where can they get a copy of the book? Well, you just Google Dalek Christianity and you can get it not on Amazon if you want. So you can get it in all sorts <laughs> of places. It's available worldwide. So that's brilliant. Uh, uh, you can, I, do, I just use Facebook to, uh, I am on Twitter as well, or now called X as uh, worshipper underscore Tom. So it's worshipper with two Ps. So if you actually Google worshipper Tom, sometimes I got I got confused as the Americans spell it with one P and I yeah. changed a few things to one P and made me difficult. So either worshipper Tom with one P or two Ps. I'm not quite sure which, which is the best one to find me. Uh, so interesting stuff about my book. Yeah, Facebook is, is really the place uh, uh, to, although, you i'm kind of like if you if you know me that's fine if you don't know me i'm like yeah i haven't really worked this one through have i no yeah. but obviously you can follow me on twitter and my handle is worshipper tom and you will see yeah. you'll see an image of what looks like a dalek but the publishers very cleverly have managed to create a graphic that looks like a dalek but doesn't break any copyright yeah with um, um terry nation so that is <laughs> that's worth getting a publisher for also, yeah. please get a good publisher because they stopped me from libeling the Sun. Because at one point I yes. mentioned the Sun newspaper ran a story about Rottweilers, and they said, "Hmm, perhaps you could say the tabloid press." Like, yeah. yeah. So, well worth. So, although <laughs> it's kind of self, it's kind of a self-publishing project. I used a proper publisher called the Invisible Imprint, and they provided mm -hmm. all the proper editorial and all the sales. So now it's on every platform you can imagine. Yeah. In, country i can think of big thank you to tom schwartz for joining me you're listening to the arch on 106.6 fm wickham sound i'm your host dane cobain and this is annette valentine with i'm still waiting the first time i saw you i could feel a connection we gelled instantly you weren't short of perfection the way you softly talk to me Cherishing your company When you don't call for a couple of days I start to get scared and my heart is ablaze With every passing embrace I want to quicken the pace The more I hear from you The more I want to see you I'm impatient, you're right, it's true But wait something I just can't chew Waiting is something I just can't chew If you told me you 
left me, my heart will relax. I wait for that moment to be stopped in my tracks. When you're standing next to me, I feel you're in a harmony. My heart is pounding every time. I feel the touch of your lips on mine. I'm not wanting to leave forever to believe. The more I hear from you, the more I want to see you. I'm impatient, you're right, it's true. But waiting is something I just can't chew. Waiting is something I just can't chew. Something I just can't chew. Waiting is something I just can't chew.
That was Wait and Wonder by San Dimas, and before that we had I'm Still Waiting by Annette Valentine. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the York Shed now to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. The Avalanches, Since I Left You, a CD I bought from a charity shop in Henley. I think it was Helen and Douglas. The Avalanches are Australian dance music producers. This album came out in 2000. I remember hearing the track Frontier Psychiatrist in the early 2000s and it stood out amongst all the similar tracks I was hearing at the time, mostly because of the humour. Apparently the spoken samples came from a comedy sketch, an archetypal sound in Psychiatrist stating that that boy needs therapy. This is accompanied by horns, strings, big drums, choral voices, all kinds of vocal samples and it ends with a Mexican acoustic guitar piece. Everything is time stretched and re-pitched to match up. It is a track I still hear and it always amuses me. It is something you might hear on one of those cheap TV shows where minor celebrities reminisce with implausible accuracy. It was a time of Chemical Brothers, The Prodigy and Fat Boy Slim. They call it Plunder Phonics, new music from old created by people who listen to piles of old records looking for suitable short clips and then matching those clips in a musical mosaic. This album is a bit hip hop, a bit disco, a bit easy listening and quite psychedelic, dreamy soundscapes and monstrous beats and riffs. However, though everything else on it is very good, nothing stands out for me like Frontier Psychiatrist. I think I was expecting more humour. I had to re-listen to it as a serious piece of music and it does stand up. Everything feels nostalgic. It is music that is recognisable as being from olden days. It sounds familiar even if you have never actually heard most of it before. I know I can hear some of the Lawrence of Arabia music a bit of Kid Creole and the Coconuts, and I think I spotted some Boney M. The title track is built around a sample of a female singer singing a very memorable line. It is not unlike a vocal that bands like Massive Attack or Soul to Soul would bring someone in to sing. But the avalanches just use the samples, backing it with other samples. So where Moby would have played the sample over a drum loop and played other instruments, this sounds nothing like someone playing other instruments. These are songs constructed with different parts from different sources. Recycling well played, arranged and well recorded passages that would otherwise be forgotten. There is never just one loop like Bittersweet Symphony. The drum track will use different patterns from different sources. I much prefer the sound of a string section all playing together rather than the buzzy string pads used in other dance music. It is said the avalanches used 3,500 samples. A sample they seem to use often is a horse's neigh, which is another reason I find them amusing. The avalanches, since I left you. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Simon Gregory for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with MP3s to share, local arts, news, etc. Don't hesitate to get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. And we are repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune for this week, and this is Waterfall with Bundle of Sticks. I'll catch you next week. In the corner of society Sits the wise old man Guardian of decency In a world gone mad He sees the boy men racing by Imaginary garlands round their heads Endless words dripping from their lips They don't hear him say See this bundle of sticks is strong because of its mix 
Don't they break us like twigs, don't untie See this bundle of sticks is strong because of its mix Alone they break us like twigs, don't untie Stone and die. 